If the phrase debt free or die trying resonates with you, today we're talking to the author of the book with that title. He paid off $30,000. He's living debt free and says you can too. Episode 271 features the Marcus Garrett, author, speaker, entrepreneur. You know, ignorance in this case is not bliss. Ignorance of how much debt you have is actually uh, suffering because you just know it's this big, like you said, it's a mountain, this mountain that I can't climb or overcome. I personally like to know on this date, I'll be debt free. And in this case, I wanted to be debt free by 30 because at that time I thought 30 was old. I was in my late 20s. <laughs> And so I was like, I got to get this behind me by 30 because life ends at 30. Hey, Inspired Money Maker. I'm Andy Wong, host of the Inspired Money Podcast, where we share positive perspectives on money so we can make a bigger impact in our communities and in the world. As I think about what Inspired Money means, I believe that together we can all do better with our money. It doesn't matter where you are right now. Of course, we're not all in the same place. Some of us have debt while others do not. Some of us are making six figures or more, while some of us are aspiring to get there. In my view, the focus of Inspired Money is this, lifestyle, making more and giving more. We want to live with purpose and intention. What good is money if you cannot enjoy life, right? In future episodes, I want to explore lifestyle. That includes things that I do not know much about, like wine and watches. And we want to be inspired by success stories of those making money well, and then great causes that are worth donating to. If you have ideas for the show, send me an email by going to inspiredmoney.fm slash Andy. I'd love to hear your feedback. Today, we have the Marcus Garrett on the show. He's a recovering auditor. As mentioned, he wrote the book, Debt Free or Die Trying. In his case, he achieved his goal of living debt free by age 30. He's an award-winning freelance writer on topics ranging from love and relationships to debt and personal finance. In this episode, you'll learn about money mistakes that Marcus made that got him $30,000 in debt, how to make a plan and set up a system to pay off debt, the 50, 30, 20 approach to budgeting, and make sure to tune in to the end to hear one regret that Marcus had while cutting his expenses. Find out what he'd do differently if he could do it all over again. Now let's get inspired with the Marcus Garrett. Marcus, welcome to Inspired Money. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Right. You got the radio voice. I like that. Hey, I got to drop an octave once, once we get started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you're like all normal and then it's like, hey, how are you? <laughs> you got to drop the register when things get serious. <laughs> So to me, it sounds like you had some really good money lessons growing up from your parents. Can you share with us, like, what are some of the valuable lessons that you learned as a kid that you took into adulthood? Great question. I was just talking to my uh, father about this, uh, and I'll start there. And I really appreciate and I'm more grateful for the relationship that we have. So my father is 72 or 73, some, some age that I actually probably should know. Uh, I'm 40 this year. So it's really been great to watch our relationship evolve and the discussions evolve. And we were talking this weekend um, like friends. You know, he'll, he'll always obviously be my father, I'll always be his son. But it's been great to see that relationship evolve and recognize how blessed I am to still have my mother and my father in my life in order to have those conversations. And I say that because growing up, my perspective, my mom has a different one. She listens to the show and she corrects me every time. We didn't talk about money that much. Uh, it was, and, and I've noticed this a lot in my interviews. From my perspective, it's kind of that old school, we're parents, we make money, you kids, you go to school. <laughs> don't don't worry about how it's done and what we do. And I say that's unfortunate because my parents are really good with money. They're they're well set now. Um, they've produced two well set children. Um, me and my wife, or excuse me, yeah, well, actually, me and my wife, but I was going to say me and my sister are, are financially set and well off. And I'll tie that to something my father said this weekend. Is a lot of it seems to be soaked in. 
So we didn't have those conversations when I was young, but they did establish a, we opened my checking account when I was 16. I remember instead of just giving me money to buy this used car that I was obsessed with, they went half on it. So I learned those early money lessons about saving towards a goal. I got my first job at 16. Uh, and I got that because they were like, well, you know, if you want a car, get a job. And I walked over to the movie theater. I like, I remember waiting until the day I turned 16. <laughs> I walked over to the movie theater. It was like two miles away, uphill both ways, of course, and applied for that job and be begin that that savings journey. And so I, I although we didn't talk about it, I was still very fortunate to have parents that were good with money. So I was able to see what good with money looked like. So it was kind of. Um, by example, not so much discussion, not discussing or having those conversations. Right. The, the the debate that me and my mom continue to have, <laughs> her more than me, she's, she's the debater and I'm the listener, is that her perspective is, well, I did that so you would be good with money, you and your sister. And, and the fact that y'all are good with money now is the demonstration of my success as a mother. <laughs> but uh, I think, you know, uh, in talking about personal finance and being in the space that you know, it's not a lesson that you can say one time. So she's like, oh, I set up a savings account, but I really wish we we didn't. And from my perspective, and this is something I focus on in my business is talk about the why. Uh, so I was like, yeah, we're setting up a savings account uh, for this car that I want. But I didn't connect uh, and, and to this day. Now that I'm thinking about it, I didn't know my savings rate. I just knew that I wanted a car. Uh, I didn't know why we were setting up a savings account. For all I know, I could have put it in the mattress. You know, I just put it there because she said so. She's my mother. They're my father. Um, and so I just wish we had more money discussions around the why, but I'm very grateful that they are still in my life, which, you know, I recognize at 40, that's a, a claim that uh, folks are making less of at this point, because now we can have those evolved discussions. Uh, my mom actually listened to a show. I had a, uh, a state planner on and actually it was the other way around. My mom's my executive producer. So she suggested <laughs> <laughs> she's not, she thinks she is. Um, she suggested I have a show uh, strongly suggested because she has some questions about estate planning. And I, coincidentally, I had somebody in my network that was already an estate planner. And she's a lawyer and that's what she focused on. So I was like, you know what, mom, just send me your questions and that will be the format of the show. And it actually turned out to be a, a very popular episode. Uh, I have to send it to you. I, I don't have the name in front of me. Uh, and it worked out well. And she, although she did not go with that estate planner, it inspired her and my father to revisit visit their estate plan. And now they have one in place. And actually, we're supposed to talk about it in a few months. So it's, it's been really great, despite the debates and, and maybe uh, different perspectives on um, uh, how it came to be that we've been able to evolve those discussions over time into where we are now, where we're building wealth as a family. Well, congratulations. I think you're in a rare group who you can say that you have family members who actually listen to your show. <laughs> Most of us don't have that luxury. And it sounds like really it was a luxury that your parents put you on like solid financial footing growing up, going to school. But the reality is that there are always forks in the road where you have to make a choice and there's like a right choice or a wrong choice about money. You're very open that you, you haven't always made the right choices. You've made mistakes and you've shared your experiences about what not to do. Like dig into that a little bit. Like when you get to the fork in the road, yeah. because what are you thinking about? Are you thinking about the car or are you thinking about how your parents did it? Well, it, it, it's two. Uh, number one, I would caution that you should be careful about your family listening to the show because now they're all executive producers. They all have got uh, suggestions about videos and formats and things that I should do. I'm not going to say the percentage of which is good. <laughs> Do you have to pay those family members? I don't. There, there is that. So, you know, you, you give and take, you give and take. Uh, it's free advice. Yeah, exactly. The, the financial side. Um, you're right. So for those who are unaware in the audience, so I wrote a book about my lived experience of burying myself $30,000 in debt. The book is Debt Free or Die Trying. Um, and because we didn't have those discussions when I, I was young, I'll tell two stories. One is in the book. Actually, one is not in the book. And so the first story is I actually feel that 
one of the disadvantages that I have about not talking about money in the household was that I thought it would always be easy. I didn't recognize that I only had one bill and it wasn't even the car note because we paid cash for that car that I'm talking about, which I immediately wrecked like six months later. And before I, I went to prom, I remember because I couldn't go to prom because I wrecked the car. That being said, um, the first story is prom night, senior year. So I didn't go to, I, I went to prom my sophomore year, wrecked a car my junior year, and I went my senior year. <laughs> and uh, in between there, uh, I saved up a few thousand dollars um, in, in that same savings account, I might add. And I think I exhausted, if not all of it, a majority of it, which is thematic for my life, for my prom experience. So I was like, you know, a few thousand dollars, I, I, this isn't nothing. This is easy to save up. Uh, which I struggle to save now if I wanted to just save a few thousand dollars this month. So at age 16, I was like, this was a piece of cake, you know, uh, with my one bill. And so I was like, I'll always be able to reproduce this success. So I went out, I got a, I can remember, I got a Miata. <laughs> I got a Mazda Miata and my father had uh, unfortunately t told me how to uh, drive stick shift. Bringing my parents into this story, I remember I went to them first. I was like, hey, I would like to uh, rent a car for prom. And they were like, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> We're not co-signing on that for reasons unknown. My boss at the time, I guess I was such a dependable, uh, by now I'd moved on to being a waiter. I was such a, just a dependable wait staff person that he signed off on the Miata. He ended up putting 200 extra miles on it and paying the extra fees. So I had this great sports car for my prom night. I got a block of hotel rooms. Like I was throwing a wedding <laughs> for, for all my friends. Cause I was the only one with a credit card. Cause I was uh, one of those early 18 turner. So I'm a senior, but I'm 18. So I'm like rooms on me. <laughs> Feels like I exhausted all, all my uh, funds. And I know it was somewhere in there, but I paid cash for it. Uh, I, you know, much like Kanye, I still feel like there's some friends that owe me checks. Uh, Cause I don't remember getting full reimbursement for that block of rooms, which they promised they, they would. Of course, this was before cash app, I might add. So we didn't have any way to exchange funds. I feel like I was shorted though. So, that, I mean, that's story number one. And then I, 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 it took me many moons in a college experience, which leads to story number two, before I was able to replenish those funds. So that false head start, the fact that we didn't have those discussions around really how difficult and the why of saving money, I, I, I think I, I oversimplified the process and I definitely underestimated what it would take to be uh, financially responsible. It was weird. I had the outcome of a financially responsible person saving thousands of dollars but I did not have what I talk about today, a system for repeating the process. Mm. So I'll, I'll pause there. I don't know if you have any questions around that story. And then of course, the next one is what I tell in the book. Okay. T share the, share the book story. So the book story again, thematically. So I go to college, I get three credit cards. Uh, and I feel like every senior or elder millennial has this story. I'm walking through the yard. They're like, Hey, you want a t-shirt Just sign up for these credit cards? I'm like, I do want a t-shirt. <laughs> I got a yo-yo for mine. So I feel like I'm one of, uh, one of few people that got a yo-yo. I don't know where that yo-yo is. I do know where the debt went. Uh, I signed up for three credit cards and I actually got out of college fairly reasonable, uh, looking back with about $9,000 in debt, uh, most of my college was covered by uh, a fund that my parents had set up, actually, Texas Tomorrow Fund. Uh, it went bankrupt several years later because, as y'all see, y'all seen college costs. They went up about 300 percent, but you could lock in college rates. So my parents took advantage of that. And then I got like a small loan because I transferred colleges. So I, I came out of school with about twelve thousand dollars in debt. And so I was like, hey, uh, actually, I was not. I got like this colorful letter in the mail, similar to that T-shirt on the yard and that yo-yo. And they're like, hey, would you like a consolidation loan? I never heard of a consolidation loan in my life, but it looked pretty great marketing. Uh, the, the person on the letter looked like me. He looked happy. So I applied and I moved on with my life. Got my first job making $19,000, which I was very disappointed about because I thought I'd be making six figures right out of college. And then this consolidation loan come in. And so for those doing the math at home, I've never had a job making more than $9. And it actually, disappointingly, my first salary job paid less than $9 an hour and, you know, benefits and all those other things. But I'm looking at the take home pay. And then I got this consolidation loan for, I, I can't remember to call the exact amount. It's in the book. I think it was 10 or 15,000. I'm 22 years old. And so I went shopping <laughs> because in my mind, they were going to pay off the credit cards for me. I, I don't know why they wrote a 22 year old, this blank check who had never demonstrated financial responsibility in the first 22 years of his life. And ultimately what becomes a story in the book, that particular weekend I spent 
$26,000, I believe it was, pre-interest, uh, without calculating the interest in one week. And I, I, for people trying to figure that math out at home, I also used some of the check for a down payment on a car, you know, with rims, because I have my standards. And uh, so by the end of the weekend, between myself and my girlfriend, who was an enabler, financial enabler, as I call her at the time, we had $26,000 in debt. And um, so folks, Obviously, the logical question is like, oh, man, you you're clearly done. You know that that was it. But you see the book is titled thirty thousand dollars in debt. And so I tell that story over and over again, be telling about 10 years now. And the one piece that people can't buy into, they can believe all that. They can see me buying a car with rims, but they cannot believe that I bought a flat screen TV when it first came out. When flat screen TVs first came out, they were three thousand dollars. People cannot wrap their head around that a TV used to be $3,000 and it was a 42 inch. I got a 70 inch now. I think it was $300 <laughs> and I put that on a loan. So that's how we, uh, between interest and everything, that's how we get up to the $30,000 in debt. That was a crazy weekend. <laughs> it was. <laughs> Is Was that like you only live once? Like you wanted to live? Like what was that? You know, I don't even think I thought about it. I don't think I had the mental wherewithal to wrap my head around what I was doing. I'd spend the next seven years paying off that weekend because I wouldn't get out of debt till I was 30. Um, but really, I think, and I, I mean, I don't know how 22 year olds think now. They seem to be smarter than me, uh, they, you know, with the exposure to the Internet and things like that. But at that time, I was like, you know, this ain't nothing to me. This little, this little 50,000 is a little, you know, this, this ain't nothing. I just got a college degree. I'm obviously there's been a misunderstanding at this first job where they paid me 19,600. Obviously, six figures is right around the corner. You know, I'll spend this little 15,000. It ain't nothing. And it, like, I'll just I'll just get it back. And again, that ties back to that 16 year old story because I had never had a system and I never had like a financial plan. I just had dreams and wishes. I never had a system for establishing my goals. And I paid the price quite literally. It was fueled by optimism. <laughs> Ignorant optimism, yes. So it took five to seven years to pay down that debt. Before we get into like systems, what, what does rock bottom look for you being saddled with debt. I remember it exactly. And so by now, uh, that girlfriend that helped me spend it has left. <laughs> so I'm single and alone and uh, I'm moving back to my hometown, I'm going back to Austin, Texas. Uh, and I'm, I think by then I was about $30,000 in debt. I think I had reached my peak at that point. I still don't have the six figure job and I actually need to move in with a friend back in Austin, Texas, because I can't afford rent in Austin, Texas. T to this day, that actually seems to be true. A lot of people still can't afford rent in Austin, Texas. And um, I get there and I start picking up jobs because at that time I only knew how to trade time for money. And so I had a nine to five job. Uh, I was making 50,000 and then I picked up a part time job putting computers together at, at a warehouse. I was putting Dell computers together. Uh, so I, I, to this day, I apologize for people who got computers between 2005 and roughly 2009, because I hated that job and I know I took it out on those computers. So if you have a Dell computer that didn't work around that time frame, I apologize to you. You know, I have your people contact my people. And then I was working at AT&T. And actually, let me back up. I was working at Singular which was purchased and bought out by AT&T. And I bring that up because I started, I'm not a salesperson, I'm not a salesperson to this day, but I started right when they introduced this thing called the iPhone. And basically all you had to do was stand in the store and people would fight you to give you money. And so I was making these crazy commission checks. And so I was able to start knocking down that debt. And I, I tell people that I, I was at the point where I was living what would become debt for your diet trying, but I just didn't realize it. And I still hadn't hit rock bottom. What happened was working those three jobs. Uh, and actually I picked up a fourth job at one, at one point I was working nights uh, at a hotel. And the only reason I quit is because I was falling asleep literally on the job. It's, I was, you know, I was just trying to make money. I was clawing to make money so I could pay off these bills and I was barely making the minimum. I missed a payment which to this day, uh, me and this credit card company might disagree on. They, they, I, they think I missed a payment. I didn't ever get the bill. Uh, cause I, that's actually a, a point of pride for me. I've never missed a, a credit card payment in my life except for this one. 
And for those of you listening at home, maybe you can relate to this. When you miss one credit card bill, I found out uh, for my friends who signed me up for that yo-yo, the interest rate quadrupled. It was 29.99% overnight. And I realized despite the fact that I was working three jobs, I wasn't going to be able to make the minimum payment next month. And because my, I mean, I didn't even know what it was at the time, but I imagine my credit score was in shambles. Um, I was like, well, you know, I remember that consolidation loan. I also noticed I wasn't getting any more consolidation loans because, you know, banks, they loan you, banks are like, uh, what is the saying? Banks give you an umbrella when it's sunny, take it back when it's raining. So it was raining for me and they weren't providing any umbrellas in the form of a uh, consolidation loan. And I got one offer in the mail. And I realized when I was making that phone call that if they say no, I don't have a backup plan. I don't have a plan. This is plan A through Z. This is the only plan. And fortunately, as y'all might guess, that story ended with yes, but that was my rock bottom. I remember hanging up that phone and feeling like, like the worst I'd ever felt. Like, how did I, I put myself in this position? How did I get here? And I, I just, I made a promise that night that I would never put myself in that position again. That was, that was my rock bottom. Yeah. You had a feeling of hopelessness because the mountain was so big to climb and working three, four jobs that you were maxed out on the income. Like that's the most you could make physically <laughs> at that right. time for people who are out there and they feel financially hopeless. Where do they start? Like, where do you go from there? How do you start building a system that's going to work and carry you through that you can sustain? So I've been answering this question two ways recently, um, because now I look back, and at that time, uh, cause I wonder how I accomplished some of this sometimes. I'm like, how did I even, like, how did I even get that far into debt? You, first of all, you'd be amazed what a bank will give you no matter how deep in debt you are until it's too late. But secondly, um, you know, in this day and age, debt was really cheap back then. Gas was a dollar. I remember, I remember me and my friends were shocked when gas hit a dollar. <laughs> Like we were appalled. Like there's, there's three digits on the, have you seen the gas station? There's three digits on the gas station. This is insane. Uh, so, you know, I want to empathize with people dealing with debt today because it is a different reality where inflation is, uh, how much debt costs, uh, at that time. Uh, I know it was under 18% because recently average credit card debt is about 18% APR. And I imagine it's gone up from there because of the increase in bank rates. So I start there that it is a difficult reality to be in debt in this environment. But I still pivot to and my original answer was, it's hard to see what you can overcome when you're at your rock bottom, but not to underestimate yourself and to recognize that you can beat this. Um, in this particular circumstance, it was a situation I put myself in and I knew it was going to be a situation that I'm going to get myself out of. And that's why I chose, you know, debt free or die trying, not debt free until inconvenient or debt free until I get tired. Like it, if this is going to be a journey that you follow, it needs to it it needs to mean something like you got to put your all into it. Um, and so I would share with those people the system that I have now. I actually rewrote the book and re-released it in 2020. Uh, it used to be written like a blog because I was a blogger uh, coming up, which is another way that I made money. <laughs> uh, just like a kid, just collecting money making. Uh, at that time, we didn't have hashtag side hustles, but I was a side hustler before it became popular. And the acronym now is debt, which is define the problem. Uh, go to annualcreditreport.com. E, establish a plan. So whether you're going to do the debt snowball, debt avalanche, I cover two others, the whatever, uh, but I like to tie it to a system. I get my systems from bakerate.com. I got my first debt at rock bottom that evening. I got my first debt plan at bakerate.com slash calculators with an S and they are still around today. Probably not as big as they used to do, but they're still a great tool. Nerd wallet's a great tool. So there's plenty of tools out there. I'm agnostic to the tool because the best system is the system that works. B is build a budget around so now you know what your problem is how much debt you have because a lot of i think it's about 40 to 30 percent don't even know how much debt they have they just know they have debt they definitely don't know how much total debt they have you've answered that you've established a plan about how you're going to pay off that debt now you need to build a budget around that and then t is trust the process and i say trust the process because it i'm an auditor by trade it's inevitable if you follow the system you will pay off this debt what intimidates people 
I think is two is, you know, ignorance in this case is not bliss. Ignorance of how much debt you have is actually uh, suffering because you just know it's this big, like you said, it's a mountain, this mountain that I can't climb or overcome. I personally like to know on this date, I'll be debt free. And in this case, I wanted to be debt free by 30 because at that time I thought 30 was old. I was in my late 20s. <laughs> And so I was like, I got to get this behind me by 30 because life ends at 30. Uh, but I knew that meant 36 months. I put that in my calculator and it told me pay this amount of money. And in 36 months, you will be debt free. And I ultimately, I just had to trust the process and it came true. So, you, so you put it down on paper and you could see it and there was a plan. And then each month you could take a look and say, am I on plan or do I have to make an adjustment? Yeah, that brought me, and I think it, it, it another thing I, I try to, t you know, put the personal and personal finance, but I try to tailor a lot of these plans. Now that brought me a lot of peace. And I say that because me and my wife just bought a home. Um, I put the, one of the second things, it wasn't the first thing, but one of the second or third things I did was pull out the amortization schedule. Cause I'm like, when is this home <laughs> going to be paid off? And it, like she saw that number and like, I think she did, she lost sleep for two or three days. And like, for me, it, it, it brings me great peace to know when I'm going to hit the finish line, even 30 years in the future. So that's what kind of that. Then I walked through that in the book, like what type of personality are you? What type of person are you? So you can put a system that works because that's what matters. So for her, she doesn't want to look at that big number. She just knows, wants to know how much to pay each month. Uh, as a result of that downstream, she was like, okay, well, how do we pay that down quicker? And then she read some things on that. Like, she's like, I want that number is gone as quickly as, as possible. And that's kind of that, you know, uh, that's just two people, but like, what is your personality type? What motivates you? What's going to keep you on that system, which is what people are going to struggle with over time. It, Cause it's not as fun. It's actually the opposite of fun. Getting into debt. People ask me this a lot. You know, do you regret that weekend? And it's a very difficult question to answer because I had the time of my life. <laughs> it's one of the better weekends of my life. It might've been the best second only to marrying my wife. Of course. <laughs> you also learned a lot following yeah, that weekend. Exactly. I mean, it was a life experience, right? I, I, I don't know where I would be, but for that experience. So it's, it's very difficult to answer. Um, but I encourage people for most, uh, I would say the majority would, would benefit from having a system, a place that tells them when they'll reach the top of that mountaintop, which in this case will be becoming debt free. For the B part of this debt acronym, how much could you save? Like how much could you cut and actually make an impact? I think the... Unfortunately, the answer I'm going to give is it depends. But in my particular circumstance, what I did is I cut everything. I mean, I'm, I'm that type of person. Uh, so some people hate that type of austerity. Like, yeah, I mean, I cut cable. I cut, uh, I, I think at some point I was eating cheese sandwiches and pasta to get by. Uh, but I was just so focused on getting out of debt. And another thing I did that I think not enough people talk about enough. So I cut all the expenses uh, that weren't relevant to me. And it's funny because I talk about this in the book. I, uh, I, I didn't realize it, but I, I went back and um, tied it to a 50, 30, 20 budget, which I still like to this day. So 50% for needs, 30% for wants, 20% for savings and debt. Uh, and y'all can read up about this. It's just a great structure. Y'all know I like a system. And it, what still trips people up to this day is wants. Uh, most people think whatever the, everything they want is a need. And so I remember this was like the, the most questions I got in the book. And I, when I rewrote it, I put wants, needs, and luxuries. And I still think it tr trips people up. <laughs> so, so once again, I would say anything that's not, uh, what is it, Maslow's Law, that's not contributing to your home, roof over your head, food is not, and even food can be uh, difficult, is not a need. So I cut all my wants out. Cable's gone. I started shaving my head. I saw it, which saved me like $2,000 a year. I was shaving my head at the time on haircuts and everything like that. So if, if I did not need it, and I mean very specifically, if I did not need it in my life, I cut it. And so I was able to save thousands of dollars just doing that each year. And I put that in a table in the book. Um, but also what I did and don't, people don't talk about enough is I scaled my income because although I was working three jobs, it was successful selling those AT&T phones did bring a lot of money in, even though I wasn't a good salesman. And so I started looking for work around the country 
And I was like, you know, if I could just make as much as I make at these three jobs in one job, I clearly know that's doable. So I was making about 70,000 that year in total. So the 50,000, uh, nine to five and about 20,000 between the, all the contract work that I was doing. And I started going out and looking for a job that I can, that was the motivation for finding the job was how, how do I make 70,000? And the story that I tell there is I applied for this job in Denver, didn't know anything about Denver other than we visited in the winter with my parents, uh, which I found out later they have a timeshare out there. Uh, I just knew we went every year and I had no idea why. And so I was like, hey, I always enjoyed myself when I was out there in Denver. So I put that on the list, but I was applying all over the country. It's uh I say this because it's 2008. Uh, some of y'all remember there was a little, a few things going wrong. Uh, they later called it the great recession. So I'm out there looking for a job in the great recession and I need to make $70,000. And I got an interview, uh, for an audit position in the, with the city and county of Denver it turned out to be a great experience, both the job and, uh, whom I ultimately ended up working for it became my mentor. But I remember during the interviewing process, uh, they were like, what's your salary requirements? And I was like, well, and in my head, I was like, I got to make $70,000. And that was based on like a movie I'd watched once. I just had in my head that $70,000 was a lot of money because it was a lot of money in this movie I watched. And I was like, $70,000. And he said, yes, so quickly <laughs> that to this day, I lose sleep over how much money I could have asked for, uh, which ultimately became another pivot that you, as you talked about another fork in the road later in my journey. Like I do a lot of compensation analysis now, and I try to coach people to know how much you are actually worth when you negotiate your salary, which is something I didn't. So I was able to cut a lot of expenses in my needs. Uh, anything that was truly a need I cut or excuse me, a want I cut. And I also grew my income. Yeah. With very realistic, uh, definitions of needs. Um, yeah, I guess you really have to, um, face reality. And you can't say that I need, I need to have like lobster for dinner. <laughs> you don't need lobster for dinner. Right. Uh, I would only say that I've softened on that a little bit, uh, with, well, it depends how much the person struggles for, but for a person who struggles with that, I mean, I was on that journey for 36 months. That's a long time to cut out once, uh, as a lot of people can relate to is, you know, maybe a 80, 20 or something like that. Just our, our small celebrations to justify the journey. Uh, I was talking to a friend recently and I actually encouraged him to move. Uh, he's switching cities and I was, he came to me. He's like, Hey, you've done this before. Would you do it again? Yes. I was like, yes. In a heartbeat, take the opportunity. If for nothing else, for the growth that you will have from coming from it. But recently I was talking to him. He's about a year into his journey. Ultimately he took it. I go, the only thing I regret about that Denver experience is actually how hard I went because the one thing you can't recreate, he was talking about, Oh, I'm going to miss this and miss that. Cause I got to get this money. And I was like, you know, you can, you know, with, within measure, make more money. You can always find some way. There's always going to be a contract job out there. There'll always be a side hustle to make uh, more money out there, but you can't recreate experiences. And I feel like for seven years, I was so focused on that mountain and that debt journey. I missed out on experiences that can never be recreated marriages and family and children. And I was, I was, I've said to him that I watched life through Facebook. And that's the one thing I would caution around is if you're going to go on this journey, keeping in mind how hard you're going to go on it, uh, when, when trying to reach that goal of, of debt freedom, it, it's important, but it's not everything. So maybe you could have lived some experiences and finished in 10 years instead of seven. Yeah. I wish I had built in the experience side of it. How did it feel to achieve your goal and be debt free? That's a great question. And it's funny because by that point, one thing I haven't spoken about this whole time is I automated everything. So I, once again, I knew how much I was need to be out of debt. So I started automating the process and it was painful for like the first few months. Uh, but by that fourth or fifth month, you, you know, it's like any pain, you'd be surprised what you get used to. I didn't really notice it. It's just kind of running behind the scenes. I knew eventually I'd be out of debt in 36 months. And I say that because when the 36 month came, I didn't know I was out of debt. I, I, I had a bunch of money on the 37th month. <laughs> I was like, what, what's going on here? And it's because all the debt was paid off. So now it's coming back into my savings and investment accounts. And I was like, oh, well, and it took my girlfriend at the time. Cause she of course knew the journey that I was on. She's like, Hey, aren't you out of debt? <laughs> that thing you've been working on for 36 months, three years that you've always been talking about. I was like, oh, oh, let me check my account. I was like, yeah, I am. And, uh, you know, that might be a good 
point for people to realize it, it seems so hopeless. And so uh, as we were talking about, you know, when you're at rock bottom, it seems so hopeless and it, it'll, it'll be there forever. I'll never overcome this. Um, so automating the process is a good way to kind of out of sight, out of mind, trust the process and then that you will you will get to the other side. It is inevitable, even though, though it seems implausible right now. Oh, so you automated to the point where you weren't looking at it every day or even every month. It was on autopilot. Yeah, in the beginning. Yeah, I was watching every penny. Uh, but by the end, and also I, I wanted to be out of debt by so much by that point. I, I At one point, I was putting like $1,500 a month just toward the debt because I just wanted this behind me. Uh, but I, I will share... The first time I trust be I trusted the process. Um, I actually didn't do snowball, didn't do avalanche, I didn't do any type of system. I had a that car loan was it I had emotion tied to it. I still had the car. I still had the car loan. And I was like, I just want this car loan behind me. And so I focused on that first because I was like, I want to see that at zero. And I threw all my money at that. I, that was the first loan I paid off. And I was like, oh, you know, I what a crazy idea if you if you pay more money than is owed on a bill it will eventually be paid off but that was really the first time i was like oh the, i might have something here i might have something that works here and i just kind of call that the power of zero sometimes you just maybe there's a bill that you're just emotionally exhausted of like a medical bill that's just kind of been hounding you maybe there's something in credit collections and it's just like i want to see that bill <laughs> at zero uh, i would actually recommend people tackle that one first like what is the most emotionally burdensome to you because that's going to motivate you through all the other bills and you have proof uh with a proof of concept which is something we're exploring right now one of my masterminds like you, you know it works that's great advice did you have a party or anything what did you do <laughs> with the savings or do you just say i'm gonna i'm I, I can afford an experience every now and then and otherwise i'm just gonna invest this cash and let my money work for me I don't remember any, any party or anything like that, and, which is, you know, uh, weird for me, given the two ways that I got into debt at, at 16 and 22. Um, but it was just it was real personally satisfying. Like it was that that was the party. Like, you know, I have something here that works uh, now. Let's hunker down and get the rest of this knocked out. Um, so for me, it was the accomplishment. Um, I hit the goal and that was the celebration. That was enough for me. Well, congratulations. I, I want to ask you, when and how did you generate a quarter of a million dollars in affiliate sales in one year? When was 2021? So I started up what is now Life After Debt with the Marcus Garrett. My business is mine to the Marcus Garrett. Uh, and everything that I'm about to talk about here is available at themarcusgarrett.com. And I signed two contracts, actually. Um, so I have like 20 affiliates, like uh, something like that. And this was one of my most successful. Unfortunately, this contract, uh, I'm, I still work with them, but it's not as lucrative. Uh, and this was like one of the first contracts I, I signed coming out of the gates. I worked with my website designer because um, I knew funnels worked. Uh, I still love affiliates to this day. Uh, so for, for those who are un unfamiliar at home, affiliate, pretty much the simplest one I work with right now is Amazon. So uh, I have in my newsletter, for example, hey, click this link if you're going to shop on Amazon today. Uh, you're, you, that will every link that you click will you'll be a small deposit towards me, but it will cost you nothing extra. So it's just a way to help and support people. And this particular contractor, uh, it was a multi thousand dollar purchase. So every time somebody purchased, I got a few hundred dollars back. Very successful. We built a great uh, sales campaign around it. And for about a year, uh, that's when I generated, uh, I think it was actually about 260, it's probably around 300,000 now, uh, 260,000 in the first year. How closely did that affiliate, like that company, align with what you do and your readership, your audience? Closely, but it was actually a gap, and this is what I try to identify in my affiliates. Now I'm trying to get more purposeful around this. Uh, I'm targeting YouTube uh, this year, YouTube and TikTok, of course, uh, unfortunately. So I, I told my followers for, for months, if not years, I wouldn't be dancing on TikTok, which I still haven't done, but I am on TikTok. <laughs> so I did violate one of my rules. So it could still happen. <laughs> it could, it could. <laughs> but I have not danced for dollars yet. And I tell people, if you do see me dance for dollars, there's a really big bag behind it. So <laughs> that being said, um, what I try to identify is the gap that I'm not covering. So, you know, I, I feel like I'm a you know personal finance expert as it pr relates to debt. It took a lot of 
time to get comfortable with saying that out loud. I'm like, oh, I'm not an expert. You know, there's so many people out there. Dave Ramsey's the godfather in this. Like, who am I to say that I'm an expert in this space? But I've been doing it for 20 years. So if I'm not, actually, I probably been in the wrong career space at this point. Um, in this case, she was doing investment training and I still have a, a couple other investment trainers. And so that's not something I speak to explicitly. And so I was like, hey, for those of you who want to round out your portfolio, here's this investment offer. Uh, and it, like, as, you, as you've seen, it was very successful. And it's got another aha moment for me. It's like, oh, um, I should be partnering with people, partnering with people in spaces that I don't work with. And I don't know when, but eventually I read a book called Key Person of Influence. And that's one of their five P's. They have a five P system, uh, publish, profile, partnerships, uh, product, and another P that I'm forgetting, but you can find on the website. <laughs> and that was, I went to a training and they said, Hey, you're missing two. You don't have partnerships and, uh, whatever it was at that time. You're like, you're, you're just missing two P's to become a, a key person of influence. Uh, great advice. So you're looking for some, you're looking for a product or service that complements what you do, but isn't exactly what you do. That makes sense. Yeah. There's brands that I'll, I'll pass up and not work on. Um, I don't have any offhand right now, but, uh, oh, well, there was a credit card company or credit, like, uh, what are those things called when they do multiple payments? They're, they're really popular now, actually, where you, you pay towards, um, like, okay, you break out the payments across like three months or something like that instead of paying immediately. And I was like, by now pay later. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, well, I'm a debt free guy. This is my whole book. So I was like, that doesn't really align. And it, it was lucrative. <laughs> and I was like, you know, that doesn't really align with my brand. I feel like I'll be a hypocrite advising people to get into debt. Nothing in a uh, wrong with the product. Um, but that, that's an example where this was a lucrative opportunity. I'm like, this just, it doesn't fit with what I'm trying to uh, speak to here. Marcus, I like to ask all the inspired money guests, how do you define success? That's a great question. And I think it's evolved recently, uh, just recently read Find Your Why. So I think it's evolving with age and purpose. My current Find Your Why, it's a two statement uh, that uh, Simon Sinek en encourages. It's to reach financial freedom uh, so I can do whatever I want. And I used to think that I wanted financial freedom for all these other means and purposes. But really, for me, it's the freedom that I'm chasing after. Um, so I would just like to have more control over my life and days, which I'm building towards than I currently do right now. Uh, I just, I, I quit for a while, but I went back to work and, you know, I actually like my job. I actually like it. has been one of the better jobs I've had, but at the end of the day, I have to wake up at 8 AM. <laughs> I have to be in a certain place. I have to show up where they tell me to, because that is what a job is. Um, my ideal would be to wake up and define my day. That's the type of person I am. Like, you know, uh, and some of those days I'm like, I'm not going to do anything today. Like to me, that's what success would look like. And then just to wrap up, you grew up in a household where you didn't really have money conversations. You just had to watch what your parents are doing. And hopefully through osmosis, you pick <laughs> up the skills like with you and your wife. What does that look like today? Like, how do you work? Do you work together? Oh, okay. Do you have, yeah. Do you, do you, do you set goals together? Do you, do you say I'm having a cheese sandwich today because I want a cheese sandwich? <laughs> this has been one of the more interesting processes for me to go to, especially we, so we got married in September of 22. Um, and I, I guess it also continues to evolve. So I'll, I'll say our current approach and it, it took time. Uh, and I realize now in hindsight, every other relationship I had, towards this, it was indifference. Oh, Marcus will run the money and does it. We'll do all the money things. Cause that's what he does. He's a you know money expert. Uh, whereas my wife is very involved and has her, her own thoughts and, and, uh, how she wants to handle and manage money, what she wants to accomplish. And I wouldn't say they're in misalignment with mine. There are different priorities, which is something I've learned over time. So currently what it is, uh, for example, I'm actually it'd be next week. So on my weekly paychecks, I'm saving for a different goal right now. I was going to do a no spend weekend. I know those are very popular, but it also seems very intimidating, which is again, something I've learned over the years. So I do a no needs weekend. 
<laughs> so when I get paid, I'm like this weekend, I'm only buying needs. So obviously if we need to go the first time I did it, like we had to go grocery shopping. She's like, all right, so are you not going half on groceries today? <laughs> I was like, wait, that's not what I'm saying here. Maybe I need to rebrand this. Um, so I guess the, that's a good example of, you know, we have our household goals. I'm a planner. Like I said, I'd like to be 30 years in the future. So that's kind of been like, uh, I tie it back to what was it civics my economy of scale is to focus on the 20 years the 30 years that's my subject matter expertise uh, that's my focus it's at, at it's not 50 50. whereas my wife actually brings me back into the celebration of the day to day like you know let's enjoy today let's be in the present and that has been the balancing act that we've found what it looks like in practice is we do do the traditional for bills and everything we have a joint account I personally have eight accounts because I like all of my accounts to be separated. Four of those are business. Uh, and I got that from Profit First if you want to know what those four accounts are. Um, and so like that's the system that works for me. As I said, it's this, the best system is a system that works. For us, it's managing joint bills out of the joint account, even on my no needs weekend, my no needs spend weekend, which is tied to my paycheck. Because even through all of this, I'm, no, I'm human. So I see a paycheck going there. I'm like, oh, what? Let's ball out this weekend. And so I realized I was like my, it was looking at my budget. I was like, I spend a lot on paycheck weekends. <laughs> so let's, let's thin that out, you know? Uh, and then like, I just think that's an example of tailoring a plan that works for your household. And it might even be two plans that's going to work for you individually. Well, thank you, the Marcus Garrett, for being so open with your story. And I think that's what, that's why your followers follow you because it's accessible, it's logical, it makes sense. And you're just telling the truth. You're telling your story and they're even with imperfections. So tell the inspired money listeners and viewers where they can find you and follow you. Uh, wherever you're listening or watching this, you can find Life After Debt with the Marcus Garrett, where I have weekly conversations with your favorite influencers and entrepreneurs. You can find Life After Debt on Apple Podcasts and on my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the Marcus Garrett. For everything I've talked about today, you can visit the Marcus Garrett dot com. Thank you, the Marcus Garrett. Thank you for having me. So what was your favorite inspired money moment? Marcus has a radio voice for sure. And he has a lot of great stories. My favorite inspired money moment was the way that he implemented a system and automated paying off his debt. So much so that he didn't even realize the moment when he became debt free. We know automation is very effective when it comes to money. Automation removes the emotion. Your homework is to do an inventory. See where you can automate your savings or debt payments. That way, once you've set up your system, you can let it run on autopilot. Give it a try and let me know how you make out. Before you go, please subscribe to my email by going to inspiredmoney.fm slash newsletter. Every two weeks, the Runnymede team, we write an email that highlights investment data, news and events that we think are worth sharing. Thank you for joining me on this mission. Have an inspired week and do something that scares you because that's where the magic happens.